There'll be games on Christmas night, or at least we think there will be, because the NBA just announced that the Brooklyn Nets at Portland Trailblazers game, scheduled for tomorrow night, has been postponed. The Nets do not have the league-required eight available players to proceed with the game against the Blazers. Jeff Van Gundy scheduled to be on the call on Christmas night with the Lakers and the Nets. How do you prepare for a game like this, Jeff? Uh, you don't worry about it. You just show up and whoever's there is there. And I, I don't know if it'll be the Nets, it'll be the Nets G League team, or it'll be an, a totally different NBA team. Um, it's really a, a, a tough time in the NBA right now for the fan because the fan is the one that ultimately uh, bears the burden of, you know, buying tickets to what they think they're going to see. And then, you know, they're not seeing some of these star players. And then you wonder going into this game, um, how much of a topic is it going to be Kyrie Irving coming back for the Nets and what role he plays the rest of the season? Well, I think on most broadcasts, initially you talked about Kyrie Irving and then that talk uh, diminished quite, quite often or for quite a period of time. But now that he's coming back um, in some form at some point, uh, I think it's going to ramp up again because I think it is an important topic. I think it goes directly to uh, their ability to win a championship. I think what's even more interesting is not the, ro- uh, the regular season schedule that he'll undertake. It's the playoff schedule. So if they're going to get – what if they get into a series that's 2-2? He, he's not playing on the road and, uh, you know, he's not playing in game five at home. I mean, it's, it's really uh, a challenging decision that they made. I know a lot of people have had opinions uh, on, on their decision to change their minds, but I think that's man's greatest right is right to change your mind. All of them have decided this course of action is prudent. So I think, you know, the team will benefit and the fans will benefit. Would you want him back if you were coaching the Nets? No. Nope. Uh, not not him either. It's not him. It's not even his decision. It's just uh, I'd want to play with an every night lineup that I could count on, and particularly going into the playoffs. Uh, now, if he is was or any player was still up in the air that I'm going to think about it more, I may do it for the playoffs. That might change my mind, uh, certainly. Uh, But I just wouldn't want the up and down situation. Now, that being said, Dan, I understand they're trying to get talent on the floor. You know, these, like the Lakers you saw last night, they don't have enough talent on the floor right now uh, to play at the highest level. Uh, The Nets, if they're down either Harden or Durant, they may not have enough talent on the floor to play against the very best. So I understand uh, why they're doing it. I watched the Lakers last night, at least uh, uh, a little bit of the first half, most of the first half, and Russell Westbrook is not changing. He is who he is. He's fascinating, but, man, can he be detrimental to a team? He just doesn't take care of the ball, Jeff. So what do you, I, don't, I don't know what you do with a guy who is supposed to be one of your stars. You can't change him at this point in his career. So you just sort of live and die with the highs and lows you're going to get with him? Yes, and I think you have to have known that when you traded for Westbrook. Uh, people of his at his age, they're not going to change greatly. So whatever issues you might have with him, whether it's the turnovers or sometimes the, the defensive end of the floor um, or the lack of range shooting, whatever it is that you had a problem with, uh, as you were thinking about trading for him, you have to understand that you have to take the whole package with somebody and not just be able to pick and choose what you like and to try to separate it from what you don't like. And I think um, what you just said, the most astute general managers understand is that you have to accept the whole package and you have to think that that package in the playoffs give you a better chance to win than the players you had. Now, at the core of it, It has nothing to do with whether they're better with Westbrook or without him. It comes down to with their reduced depth, 
that they had to strip their team down to get him, did that benefit them? And I would say so far this year, that lack of depth, um, particularly in the COVID era, uh, in the Anthony Davis, uh, LeBron James, uh, not being as available as a, you know, particularly for LeBron James, I think that depth problem has shown up to be a significant one. Talking to Jeff Van Gundy, he'll be on the call, the Nets and the Lakers, 8 Eastern on Christmas Day, first meeting of the season, and uh, the NBA Finals broadcast team of Mike Breen, Jeff and Mark Jackson, along with sideline reporter Lisa Salters. There was reaction, reaction that went viral last night, as they like to say. Kenny Smith said that uh, LeBron, LeBron James was being disrespectful by smoking a cigar coming in prior to last night's game. And I mentioned that Michael Jordan would smoke a cigar on the loading dock at Chicago Stadium and wait for the team bus to come in. I don't know if he was being disrespectful, but it feels like LeBron uh, was being disrespectful by smoking a cigar prior to the game. Your thoughts, Jeff? Well, I didn't know that. Um, I, again, this is a totally different era uh, from sens- sensitivities are different now. Um, and the whole social media outrage, you know, it's a it's an era of outrage. And so um, I'm not sure what the standard is for viral. I could care less about the clothes people uh, wear to the game. Uh, do I think it was a great choice? No, nah, I, I wouldn't say it was a great choice, but. Do I actually care? No, I don't. Like the, what I love about the NBA is watching LeBron James play. Like that's what I love watching uh, about LeBron James. I could really care less how he walks into the arena, even though I think, you know, I don't know if he would say it was a poor choice. I, I'm just saying I don't think it's the wisest choice, but um, it's a big who cares for me. Was Jordan ever – waiting for the Knicks bus on the loading dock when you were there? No, but, I, uh, uh, you know, the legend uh, of Jordan, uh, obviously, these stories, particularly as we all get older, um, they grow. Uh, but I, I would say this, if he was there, we would have had some guys that would be interested in that conversation. <laughs> you know? So, it, yeah. Actually, you know what? I miss the confrontational NBA, like some of the things, you know, the whole Bradford Smith story when, uh, you know, <laughs> Bradford Smith lit him up in uh, uh, Chicago stadium. And then they were playing a back to back the next night in Washington. And I guess Bradford Smith either said something or perceived as said something. And then George, I mean, I miss those stories. Like um, I, I like the, the rivalries and a little bit of the, yeah, but you Chris know. Weber Chris Weber tells the story. The Bullets were going to play the Bulls in the playoffs, and Jordan is leaning on his Lamborghini or Ferrari, and the team bus comes in, and he says, "Which one of you MFers is going to be covering me?" And it was poor Calvert Cheney, and he, you know, he put up fifty or something. But Weber said, "Mike is there." Smoking a cigar, waiting for the Bullets, <laughs> Bullets team bus to show up. Nice job by the Bullets, by the way, of pointing to the back, really had, having Calvert Cheney back. I got I to gotta talk to my man, Juwan Howard, about that, too. <laughs> Who wasn't afraid of Jordan on your team? Um, I, I don't think, you know. And maybe afraid is not a fair word, but yeah, like least Listen, intimidated. We all had... Here's the thing. We all had an incredible respect for him, um, you know, from coaches all the way through the players. And I think uh, sometimes, you know, when you respect somebody so much, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to go as hard at him as I would, you know, someone else? Um, am I willing to put him down on the floor with a hard foul as I would some other random NBA guy? And I think you know, as an NBA player back then, you had to ask yourself that because he held such sway and was, you know, obviously beloved throughout the basketball world as a player, a competitor, and like things that would be looked upon, down upon today. Um, he would, you know, 
be marveled at for back then. So I think you had to check, but I think we had, I think the one thing the Knicks did a good job of is they, they brought in players that while having an appropriate respect for players, uh, you know, we had some guys with some irrational confidence, like <laughs> I'm going to bust his ass tonight, you know, like, and, and that's why, like, I liked our team because, you know, um, you know, they were, they didn't, they weren't a back down group of guys. But, you know, you got to be careful what you ask for too. So as the coach, do you ever try to, you know, tamp it down a little bit? Like, you know, uh, Hey, Anthony Mason, he's up there. You know, you're not, you're not the one who's going to be guarding Mike. Well, no, actually you, it was just, you know, I think you have to like, you have to try to combine the humility, um, with, you know, appropriate levels of confidence. And if you can't be in the NBA, think about it. Anthony Mason, if he would have had, uh, you know, if he would have gone by what everybody else's evaluation, he might not have ever made the NBA. If he didn't have that healthy or irrational confidence. And he, he truly, when he went on the floor every night, he thought not like, well, I'm the best player on the floor. I don't know who's number two, three, four, five, <laughs> but I'm, I'm the dude. And, you know what? I think you have to have some of that irrational confidence to survive all the critiques and criticisms. Um, and it's just so hard to stay there. Uh, you think about it. This guy was like Tennessee state couldn't shoot with range. Um, but he developed into a, a terrific NBA player an all-star because of work and self-belief. It's always great to catch up with you. You you look like a mob boss there with the the background, the way you know you're you're seated there like a Sopranos episode. Well, I know where the bodies are buried, oh, Dan. Okay, right. yeah. <laughs> that's what the mothership teaches you: bury the bodies. But don't talk about where you bury no. the bodies. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, have fun on Christmas night. Merry Christmas. Thank you for uh, joining us, Jeff. As always. Merry Christmas. That's Jeff Van Gundy. He'll be uh, part of the broadcast team 8 Eastern on Christmas Day. NBA Finals uh, team, Mike Breen, Jeff Van Gundy, Mark Jackson, and uh, Lisa Solters.